The following is a Cheeky Leprechaun production. Pop culture is the entirety of ideas. Hi, right, it's me, Mario. Let the bass kick. I am the greatest. Holy eggshell. I am your father. Hey guys, episode 27 of the podcast, The Pop Culture Experience, with yours truly. And uh, look, big week in the world of pop culture, big week in the world of fandom, like what we're all a part of. If you listen to this, you're you're a part of the world of fandom. You're a fan of something. You love being a fan of something. Uh, That could be, you might be a big Harry Potter fan. You might be a big soccer fan. You might be a big... Uh, TV show, let's say Game of Thrones fan, you enjoy supporting something. You enjoy being a fan of it to an extent where, you know, you might buy some merchandise. You might get behind uh, purchasing a DVD of something or a book or, you know, a collector's edition. Whatever level of fandom you're at, there's something about banding together and enjoying something with other people. So sharing something. That's what fandoms all. That's the best part of it. Finding people that share the same passion for something as you. Now that happened this week. Well, it's happened for probably the last two years. But this week it reached its peak. In 2017, there was the superhero film Justice League, which was released. And it was very exciting. First time ever that the Justice League had appeared in a film. A live-action film together. It was a big deal. Now, we're talking... This is the world where the Avengers are a billion-dollar, multi-billion-dollar film franchise at this point. So for DC to answer with their own version of a team-up film, it was really big. But it also flopped. Okay, so this, it was it was a peculiar time because the Marvel Cinematic Universe was probably at its... At its most powerful around 2013. You could argue it has been ever since, but that's where it really was, you know, knocking down all barriers and uh, exceeding all expectations. And Warner Brothers, which own DC Comics, are sort of sitting there going, Look, guys, why aren't we doing this? What? Yep, we've just had a Nolan franchise, really good, really good. Um, why aren't we doing a universe, though? Everyone seems to be doing a universe. Actually, Zack Snyder, he's doing that Man of Steel, the Superman, yeah? Ask Zack if he wants to do a universe. Ask him if he wants to just sort of create something, um, try and fast-track it a little bit so he can catch up to sort of, you know, where Marvel's at in terms of all the characters that they've got. It's very exciting. They've got a lot of characters. Let's, we've got Superman at the moment. Let's quickly inject Batman, let's, and let's try and get Flash and everyone in there. So they go to Zack Snyder, and they, they did that, and, and Zack Snyder turned around and gave them this uh, sort of makeshift, uh, streamlined cinematic universe, which sort of jumped probably five steps in terms of, there probably could have been five standalone movies after Man of Steel to set up the rest of the Justice League before you then form the Justice League. Instead, what we got was a Batman v Superman movie, which had mixed reactions at best, um, which was also followed, important to note this, by a director's cut by Zack Snyder. So he was given a chance to put out the complete version of the film which he wanted, and that did receive better reviews from the critics that initially panned the theatrical release. From there, the, the wheels started falling off the wagon. Um, Zack was off making Justice League as Batman v Superman was getting some really bad reviews. Still did well at the box office, but still the reviews were of concern considering they're wanting to make a universe and they want to keep people interested and engaged and excited for the next installment. And then a little while after that, the the rumblings of a, you know, Zack Snyder being replaced started rearing their ugly head to a point where it inevitably came. Zack Snyder was replaced by Joss Whedon, uh, who was the director of the first Avengers and the second Avengers film. It wasn't as good, the second one, but the first one really well received. So, 
there was all this speculation about what happened, and Zack Snyder had sort of said, I'm stepping away due to a family tragedy. That was all well and good, but there was so much negativity swirling around this film now with the fact there's been now two directors work on it, both very different styles. Um, a little bit of uncertainty about was the original director who had the had the uh, sort of imagination and, and the mapping out of this whole universe, which was sort of, this film was going to be a linchpin on that universe. Now his vision's being impen- like uh, impeded upon. Like, is that going to change how this movie plays? Like, are we going to get a drastically different movie? And look, they released the movie, and safe to say, it was not well received at all. At all. So we dive into that in this episode, but largely what we're talking about is the fact that now Warner Brothers have almost admitted defeat and wrongdoing as they've gone to Zack Snyder and said, look, Zack, we're launching HBO Max, our streaming service. We want to, we want to release the Zack Snyder cut of the Justice League. We want you to go back and finish your version of the movie. Now, that movie's apparently four hours long. So the, <laughs> the reason we're talking about it is it's sounding like a totally different film. And the biggest takeaway from all this is not only that they're doing it, but the way in which it came about. And that was through fan pushing. You know, a fan base that was so adamant that they wanted to see the cut and to have this director that they really like have the chance to at least show the last film that he worked on in this franchise, show it the way it was intended and give the audience the closure to, okay, this is the movie you were meant to get, not what that other director ended up giving you, which he has said is a totally different film. So it's a really interesting win for people like us, for fans. Because, weirdly, we got what we asked for. Like, how often does that happen? Never. But it, it does raise the question, well, if this can happen, what else can fans force the hand of, or force the hand on, by a studio or by a creative? It's, it's, it's raising a lot of interesting debates about, is this a good thing that they are releasing the Snyder Cut? Is it a bad thing? But, that's what we're going to get into in this episode. So, like I did in a previous episode where we discussed the failures of the DCEU, I'm joined in this episode by the returning guest, Dane and Heath, and look, we're renewing our heated debate uh, of all things the DCEU, and largely, if we think, one, the Zack Snyder movie can be any better than the Justice League we got, and two, should it even be happening? So, let's go to that conversation. Dane and Heath, uh, felt fitting to have you guys back, given that we did a previous episode of the pop, what was the pop culture report at that time, talking about what happened to the DC EU. Is that what they were calling it back then? Back when it was a thing. Extended Universe. Yeah, DC Extended Universe. We had that very, got a little bit heated at times. Dane, very opinionated about the whole DC <laughs> Snyder Universe. Heath and I a little bit more optimistic about it, but... We sort of did that conversation last year thinking it was pretty much dead. Yet, here we are with potentially a resurrection of sorts. What do we think about the... the... I, wouldn't have... <laughs> I wouldn't have called it a resurrection. We can be hopeful, can't I we? I would have said they've, there's a faint heartbeat <laughs> on um, Snyder's version or interpretation of the Justice League. Mm. But from all reports, it's going to be an open and closed book. Uh, the new Justice League on HBO Max. So it well, won't lead to anything else. I think this is a I don't think it'll lead to anything and... either. Yeah, I can actually agree yeah. with you on that, day, and I think this is just... They've realised it's dead, and it's like, well, it's not going to go any further, but look, we might as well just give them what they were asking for anyway, knowing that it's not going to continue. But look, you wanted this thing, and we'll just give it to you anyway, because it's, it's done and dusted, and we're going to move, move past it. 
it's still very bizarre in my books. I, um, I think I did some research and there was rumoured that it lost between 50 and 100 mil at the box office, the, um, the theatrical the release. Yep. Um, yeah, and now they're investing, rumoured to be 25 to 30 mil into this Snyder Cut. You know, that's, that's a big amount of cash that they're splashing, mm. especially considering when... Cinemas are shut at the moment, and they'd be taken. They'd be hurting. I can only imagine they'd be hurting. Well, I think that was the whole. That was what sort of created a bit of groundswell today. Was the HBO Max and Warner's executive that came out and said this will be a final Snyder's finish cut. He will be able to walk away from this having done it the exact way he envisioned, and that will be minimum thirty million dollars. And people are like, "Whoa, hang on, minimum thirty? What's?" So the expectation is is that, you know, factoring in CGI, all that sort of stuff, especially in a Snyder world, we know what his CG works like. They're willing to they're willing to blow that out more. I totally agree, Dan. Why would you do that unless you're that confident that this is such a drastically different film than what we got in terms of the actual story of the film where they go, well, let's treat it as a different movie and hope that word of mouth does gain more interest. But I think it's going to be think... completely different, right? Well, that's what they're saying. They're saying it's a totally different film. Yeah. Yeah, but Warner's is a business. Let's let's get that right. So uh, it doesn't matter how different the story is. I wouldn't have thought that they would really give too much of a shit unless it's going to be a revenue-making machine, which if it gets released on HBO Max, I don't see how it's going to make too, too much um, revenue for them. Yeah, they might get some sign-ups, and whatever to this new streaming side. Yeah. But I wouldn't have thought that it's going to make the same amount of cash that a theatrical release is going to make. Like it just, I'm, I don't know, it's quite bizarre. I'm very confused about w- why they're doing it. Well, when you factor in a Netflix, which is their direct competition, you look at Netflix, that's sort of got the monopoly over the streaming world. You would probably say they're the McDonald's of the streaming world at this point. Everyone's got Netflix. You look at original Netflix content, why would you do something like this on a previously, regardless of how you feel about it, it's not a proven uh, <laughs> franchise, the Justice League. It flopped. It absolutely flopped. In the grand context of a superhero team-up film, why would you then go, let's spend more on it when we could make original content like a, God, I don't, what's what's a good Netflix original? Well, marriage Story. Out? Marriage Story. There you go. Low budget. Which would know. have been like, yeah, low budget. Incredible. Low, low yeah, budget. exactly. I, it is. It's it's surprising given that the more reports you've read about it, it certainly seems like they know they're playing to a minority of fans that want this Snyder Cut. Like, it's not the majority at all. But I guess we should probably just recap a little bit of what the hell this is, what the Snyder Cut is, in case people don't actually know, because not everyone's as uh, nerdy or as informed or, in Dane's opinion, aggressively opinionated about this. Um, In 2013, Man of Steel, Superman, the latest Superman film, was released by director Zack Snyder. Heath, you and I were big on Man of Steel. We were big fans of that, weren't we? Huge fan. Like... Honestly, one of my favorite movies. <laughs> like, Dane's poo pooing it. I don't know how anyone can can poo poo it. It's just like Fantastic such a good modern representation. Like exactly modern. It's like adaptive for this world. It's like really amazing. Um, like uh, God, what's the word I'm looking for? Dane's struggling I to understand anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Dane. What, what did you think of Man of Steel? Symbolism. That's what I was looking for. Mm. A rubbish waste of time um, with a lonely, brooding, sad sack of a Superman <laughs> that could have been played by any miserable actor in the universe. Oh, come on. He looks he looks like a Superman, doesn't he? He, yeah, he, he you're looks never going to cast him as a Superman. Yeah. But seriously, this is, probably, this is probably the range of action or acting. Dane's brooding Nothing for anyone happens, listening right? on audio. Dane, <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is the character though. Like the character is like Mopey in most like versions of Superman. Christopher Reeve is like the one exception where it's like this weird happy-go-lucky to the point that it's a bit stupid. Whereas if you read other comics or you look at other like versions of Superman in like the animated world, a lot of the time he is pretty Mopey because he's lost his entire planet. And so there's a lot of like... Oh. There's a lot of that in his character. Like, he's left his people. 
Dane said this before, though, Heath. That almost plays into one of his biggest issues with the DCEU, which was it plays more to the comic book fan than it does a mainstream audience. Mm. And that might have been to its detriment because, yeah, okay, fair enough. That is Superman traditionally in the comics for the most part. But to Dane's credit and to a lot of people's credit, Superman, the original film with Christopher Reeve, was one of the biggest superhero films of all time, so much so that Marvel have admitted that they model their superhero films mm. on that Superman template. That is That reached a more mainstream audience than what a lot of the comics do. Therefore, that is what people expect from their Superman. So when, when they got this in 2013, it's safe to say it was off to a slightly rocky start with a bit of uh, diverse opinion as to this Superman. But it wasn't, wasn't overly negative. But the reality was that Marvel at this point were kicking ass with their MCU Marvel Cinematic Universe and you know they've got hits Iron Man Thor they're pumping them out at this point so DC panic button hey Zach how about you just create your own little universe let's do a DC one and we got Batman v Superman now we spoke about that at nauseum on the on the previous podcast a lot of uh, opening night feelings that were hurt. Um, we can't get into it. We can't get into it. We can't get into no, it. No, we get watch the other down. episode if you want to hear that. Go don't, back, don't. find the, find the DC. I can feel it. <laughs> Dane was, yeah, that, that was where a lot of the uh, heated Hatred. debate came. Hate. Hatred in Dane's case. <laughs> But from there came Justice League, and we spilled in. We had, at this point, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, a bit of The Flash, a bit of Aquaman, uh, Cyborg? Cyborg. Was, well, that was about it, wasn't it? The Six. Yeah. And we had our we had the, the birth of our Justice League, and that's what we then got, the Justice League, which was Zack Snyder again. At this point, it's almost going off course. Just Zack Snyder's little universe, wasn't it? Safe to say? Yeah, because Batman vs. Superman was... wasn't that well received at all. Yeah. It was absolutely on its last legs. I believe Suicide Squad had already come out, which was a part of the same universe. It uh, was. Snyder was overseeing it. It was directed by A. I however you pronounce his last name, but yeah. that was absolute trash. Um, yeah, I thought you liked Suicide Squad, Dan. I'm going to hold you accountable there. I thought you were all right with Suicide Squad. I was all right with Suicide because it was such drivel, like, it, and everyone <laughs> knew how bad it was. Like, the, the, there were so many plot holes in that film. But like I just kind of lent into it and was like, yeah, whatever. We're Harley having a good Queen. time. Yeah, yeah Harley, Harley Quinn. And I was I was excited to I was excited to see Jared Leto's interpretation of the Joker. That's been poo pooed for a um, number of reasons, but it seems to be again that it was probably uh, uh, Warner Brothers were the ones that um, affected the outcome of that film. Yes, exactly. And then from between Suicide Squad and Batman v Superman, the rumbling started occurring that. Okay, Zack Snyder's fallen out of favour with Warner Brothers. His universe has taken too much of a dark turn. We want to brighten this thing up. At this point, Snyder's already working on Justice League. They're in the middle of shooting as BVS is released. And there's starting to be the rumblings of maybe Snyder's going to be turfed out. And that, that sort of came before the announcement of what actually happened, which ended up being Snyder announcing he was stepping away from the project due to a family tragedy. His daughter passed away and he couldn't complete the project, which is a very, you know, you're not going to cast any judgment or um, anything over that, but it, it just didn't sit right with that many people because there'd already been the, the thought put out there of Warner Brothers are getting rid of Snyder. And that's what we got. We got him replaced with Joss Whedon, who was the director of Avengers. And then from that moment, there was a lot of release media releases about issues on set, uh, creative differences between Weirden's take and Snyder's take. How involved was Snyder? Apparently, this is going to be a totally different film. We then get the end product, which was underwhelming, to say the least, in terms of a Justice League movie. The first time ever the Justice League have appeared in a film together. And it bombs. It's, as I said earlier, $657 million global uh, in an industry and in a franchise that should be a billion-dollar franchise. Very underwhelming, to say the least, boys. That was absolute all, rubbish. All those things you've just said, Daniel, <laughs> all those things you've just said, it's like a recipe for disaster. Like, so many contributing factors led mm. to this point. So, yes, he stood away because of his family tragedy, but the film itself was like just 
Doom from the beginning because they were trying to catch up with Marvel, who's had who knows how many years at this point, building up their um, franchise with like lots of different films and like everyone's buying into new characters they didn't know they would like, and then all of a sudden they're together. Whereas Warner's is trying to just like rush them all together really quickly. They were fast tracking it, absolutely, yeah. It was shot from the get go, absolutely, no doubt about it. There was all all that sort of stuff started leaking out, which wasn't going to help it. People went into the movie with a bad taste straight away. People were ready to hate it that much more, regardless of what the end product was. The movie was still crap at the end of the day. It wasn't very good. Can we jump into your thoughts, feelings, and opinions on the upcoming Justice League on Snyder's car? Yeah. Well, Heath, go like, on. Uh, because I don't it's, know a great deal about his entire vision. So I read into it when all this stuff leaked. Like there were storyboards that leaked, or even actually I think Snyder shared himself because he kind of resigned to the fact that this is never going to happen, right? And all these people were campaigning for Snyder's original vision, which he promises is completely different, right? He himself hasn't seen the film, apparently, the end theatrical release, but people have told him what it's like and he knows what his vision was like. Um, and from what I can understand, it is completely different. Like there's extra characters in it, like the Martian Manhunter and Green Lantern, apparently are both cameo in it at some point. There's scenes which were turned into short little montages, uh, which were apparently like big chunks of the film. And so those things are glossed over. And then there's uh, storylines that are kind of on the perimeter of the main plot which were just completely erased. So some of the character building you would get from Flash and Cyborg, who are two members of the League, just gets erased because there's not enough time because Snyder's vision is something like four hours long, which is absurd. Do, do, do we need that extra context? Like, I think it was a complicated, confusing film as it is. Like, do we need but that think, additional context? I, I know we need it in terms of like, yes, we need to understand more about those characters. But the issue being that, they were just trying to force these characters down people's throats so they could have the Justice League versus the Avengers. So that's the thing. I think you needed more of this character development because they didn't have their own films yet, right? Only Batman yeah. and Superman did. And then Wonder Woman had this small little you know, cameo at the end of BVS. So you then go into this ensemble film, but I don't even know who the hell these people are. And Snyder had planned on going into them, like their storyline a little bit, um, going into why Cyborg is like how he got injured, um, going into how the Flash got his powers and like his side story. And those are essentially kind of backdoor pilots, if you're going to talk TV terms, into their upcoming spin offs. Because DC were doing this backwards, right? Let's have them all together. Then we have all the individual stories come off. Whereas Marvel, all the individual stories led up to um, being together in one. This so I think you needed it for Justice League. Which, yeah. which we didn't get because it was just too much content for, for a theatrical release. With that, though, it is... I, I want to say that I... For, for a split second, there's no denying that their approach to introducing all these characters is still... It's still crap. Like, it's still not going to work they, the way they think. There's no way we should have to rely on a Justice League film to be trying to build characters... Uh, such as the Flash and Cyborg, and at that point in time, Aquaman was going to include in that too. That was be- that was prior to Aquaman's release of his own film. So yep. to to build these characters to a point where they're like, oh, people are going to be so invested in them to go away and see their own films. So that's a stupid uh, task to set yourself in 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 a film like this, anyway. But I, I'm not entirely sure from what I've read, Heath. I feel like there is going to be a far different. Uh, narrative to this movie, especially in terms of like plot points and stuff. Like you, we all remember that scene in the trailer where, uh, and this was, I don't know if this was prior to Snyder being released or not, but uh, Alfred is in the Batcave and he says he, he knew you'd come. Now there was so much talk back then about that being either Martian Manhunter or Green Lantern because there was the green glow in the trailer. That was then removed with replacing it with the expectation of it being Superman because they reworked the whole narrative of the film to make Superman's resurrection more of an evil and sort of more of a plot point in this two-hour film, which was meant to be a four-hour film. That is apparently still meant to be the case. In the four-hour extended film, that's meant to be... Heath, was it it Green Lantern? I think it was Green Lantern that that was meant to be. Not Not Martian Manhunter. 
from memory, I think it was meant to be Green Lantern because mm. in this world of Zack Snyder, um, Hal Jordan, the Green Lantern, is already like an established hero, but he's working off world because he's with the Guardians. And mm. he's not like on Earth day to day, but this big event has happened. So he's been like reassigned to go back to Earth. Yeah. So, I mean, things like that where like already you're introducing more characters you're changing pivotal points in movies where the return of Superman was actually an introduction of another character. Things like that, you start being like, well, that's shifting the whole shape narrative that they gave us in the end. So I don't know. I'm just saying, given the, the drastic time difference of the film, four hours, I mean, how's that story going to be expanded upon? You've got to factor in that Darkseid is apparently a key point in this whole film, and he wasn't mentioned once in Justice League. He might have been mentioned by name, but... Darkseid, it ends with Darkseid coming to Earth. So that's also a drastic change to the end of the film. So I, I don't know. I'd... Wasn't Darkseid going to spawn a whole other, like, Justice League 2? Yes, and that's yeah. what the... That's... So that was, his, that was his original vision, but now he's not going to be able to fulfil that because this mm. isn't going to spawn. Mm. They've come out and said there will be no spin-off, there will be no continuation, yeah. it'll be open and closed. So therefore, we're not really going to get his entire vision no, and the, and that's one of my concerns, Dane. Does this just then make the Snyder Cut people rally together again and say, now we need the full, complete version, especially if this ends up not being as good as what people hope? They go, yeah, but, you know, we didn't get the full thing in the end. Like, we still need... This is only part of it. Yeah, <laughs> this is only yeah. part. But if we got the second part, like, then it would make more sense. Because, I mean, let's face it, we know Snyder at this point, sometimes his stories aren't overly uh, easily to follow. But I, I don't know. that There's going to be cop-outs because, Dane, you're 100% right. This is meant to be part one of two. What kind of closure are people going to get from this being released? That is a fair question to ask. Would you prefer to see a four-hour film or like like a four-hour or even six-hour like extended like yeah. TV series? That's super interesting. So that's that they have mentioned that HBO Max, for anyone that doesn't know, has said that they're, they're throwing around being on a streaming service, maybe releasing it as... What did they say? Six episode, a six part episode series? Four. four, maybe one hour per. Uh, given that they've said that Snyder's Cut is a four hour version, they may be releasing it in TV format. I would much prefer it in blocks. Absolutely. Same. I think it's a smart because if you're going to run it on a streaming service, why not play to the format that it's being released in, right? Yeah. Like you're, not, um, you're not having people sit down in a cinema and watch it you're having it on a streaming service where people can binge it if they want in four hours or you could watch it week by week i think it also if that if it does end with it sort of ending on a cliffhanger it kind of plays into more of a tv format how often do you watch a tv show and it does end with that oh my god what happens here they never did another series like look at Watchmen, the most recent dc series that ends and you're like holy shit are we getting a season two and the creator's like no that's it. You just you, you'll never know. It's up to interpretation what happened next. That plays better for me on a TV series than it does a film, I think. But then do you encounter the problem does there have to be a cliffhanger at the end of every episode as well? Yeah, well, I don't know how you then cut it up. Yeah, does that change the way yeah, that's that a good point. Yeah. does the whole thing because that I think would drastically change the entire structure. It would because then you've got to work to episode format and you can't just have it like stop mid scene because it's oh we've reached our sixty minutes so yeah, yeah. it's I mean, it depends it sounds, on how it. Sorry, Heath, it sounds like what they have. He's shot everything that he needs. Basically, I think they're going to do some more voiceover work because I don't believe hmm. the actors are coming back. Is that correct? I've I, heard voiceover work as well. Yeah, so for voiceover, yeah, so work, that means you, But yeah, I mean, I don't know what thirty shot. million dollars could include. <laughs> Well, apparently CGI is very, very, very expensive. Yeah, I have. Google it once. It costs a shit ton of money. <laughs> um, but my interpretation is that he's already filmed everything that he wants. It all was just left on the cutting room floor um, unedited. I heard that he screened like a four-hour extended cut, uh, unedited cut to Warner Brothers before he left the project. Yeah, no, my understanding, Dane, is that 100% there was – he's filmed everything he wanted to film and that it's literally just a case of CG. At least that's what was pushed early on. But who knows? Was that just a, a way for Snyder Cut people to be like, it's so close to being done, just put it out? I don't know. 
I do have a, a quick one for you guys as well about yeah. the like toxic fanfare that, that was discussed yes. about uh, the Snyder Cut. Yeah. I, I didn't read much into it, but I saw you guys talking to it online. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you bring this up, Dane, <laughs> because I, I wrote some notes about this and I was going to bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a waste of time had I not brought it up. It would have, it would have. Yeah, Heath, you've been far more opinionated than I because you've you've gone to the point I've received some articles from you get, being or tags and just being like, have a listen to this crap. What's your take on it? Because you, you're quite a bit more informed, I feel. Well, no, because I just think it's it plays a bigger part in this conversation that I'm in about cancel culture, which is fucked. Um, but the main conversation that people are having about this Snyder cut is the fact that it's happening because the fans wanted it. And I think the most interesting part of this happening, that um, Warners are releasing it, <clears throat> funding it, is that the cast themselves wanted this because they were all equally unhappy about the final result. So the fact that there's a lot of articles out there at the moment saying like toxic fandom, like this is what you like, you're finally getting your way. And it's because of your like bullying that um, studios are being strung armed into releasing stuff like this. 100% not the case. I think a lot of people associate um, like comic book nerds with like aggressive internet trolls and like incels and other like minority groups out there and say that's toxic fandom which is definitely a thing like uh with like the last jedi there was all that like awful racism towards um the actress who played rose um and everyone's like was racist about the fact that she was asian for some reason and she was like bullied online yeah that is awful that wasn't happening with the snyder cut everyone's saying Oh, we've got a pretty crap movie. Pretty sure there's uh, this Snyder cut out there somewhere. People have talked about him screening this four hour movie. Can we just get that? Because we weren't happy with what we got. And this whole group of people um, banded together, raised all this money, like, were, um, because everyone was one of as bad as each other, funding like planes flying over Comic Con and stuff, saying release a Snyder cut because they were like very passionate about it. At no point here is anyone being toxic and like bullying anyone they're just saying hey warners who really like that movie and they even yeah. donated a bunch of money towards um like a bunch of different charities and causes um in support of what happened with um snyder's daughter's suicide so they're like funding charities because they love snyder as a filmmaker so much yet when warners releases this thing which they've asked for it's like oh you people are toxic yeah i don't know i've got I've got an interesting take on it because I was listening to I was li listening to another pop culture commentator talk about this and he was saying that he's he's reluctant as an African American to see this release because he he's quite anti he's not he's not anti DC he will never admit to being anti DC but he cops a fair bit of feedback online from a DC following for his his opinions on largely the Zack Snyder universe and so He's been subjected to what he has deemed a lot of racial slurring and that sort of thing. And he's like, I feel like the whole fandom of this film is toxic. And personally, I don't want to see it released. And I know a lot of people similar to me that feel they've been attacked by this movement across their own, you know, uh, commentary on it, that they're at a point where they feel that the, the Snyderverse fans are a toxic fan base and they don't want to see them get what they want after all this. And he sort of related it back to a lot of, remember the whole, um, the Marvel, Captain Marvel release and the Rotten Tomatoes scoring where there was the trolling where people went on, gave it deliberately bad reviews just to bring down the aggregated score of Captain Marvel. So it looked like it was a poorly received film. Here's where I sit on it, right? I, I tend to think that being in... Because we're focusing on a world of movies and pop culture, whether it's TV, books, whatever, I look at it like sport, where in this particular instance, you've got DC and you've got Marvel, right? So this is just... A, or And you could throw in Star Wars if you wanted to, but they're just examples of teams, right? So everyone... A lot of the time, you jump on something you really like and you support it and to no end. You want to see it succeed and often to the detriment of a competition. So for a footy team to succeed, they've got to beat another team. People seem to have that mentality when it comes to DC and Marvel. And I think I've said this to you, Heath. A lot of that 
animosity between people, especially online, and a lot of the instances where you do see people being quite aggressive towards each other, I feel is that sort of people that you would see when they're defending a sport team. Like People get personal and attack other people to protect something they really like. I don't think that just applies to snack Zack Snyder toxic fandom for his cut. I don't think that applies here any more than it does any sport that we might watch during the week or anything where you pick a side and, and you, you support something you like. I think it's pretty rough to label this as toxic fandom and a great example of it. Dame, what's your take though? I think it comes back to the woke culture of the internet now. There was all this toxic fanfare and animosity to anything and everything online and the fact that anyone could write a comment, call anyone, whatever they wanted to. Yes, that's bad. Yes, to much to uh, Heath's point, that is bullying. But now people are just undermining that with this wokeness and they're like, oh, Heath can't say, tell Dane that he can't wear a black T-shirt. Like, that's absurd. Like, and then Oxy comes in and says, well, Heath, you can't do this. You can't do that. Like, mm. And then Dane, you can't call Heath out for telling you his opinion. That's just his opinion. It's everyone just undermining everyone. It's stupidity. Bullying doesn't belong. There's obviously uh, no <laughs> doubt about that. That doesn't take a genius to figure that out. But yeah. I think films are for the fans and the fans didn't like it um, and the fans are getting what they want. And... You know, sometimes it'll happen, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it won't. This is a one-off, very rare occasion. I've mm. only seen it happen a few times before. Um, but it's like now people are dredging up like the Suicide Squad. Oh, we want to see the director's cut of that. Yeah. Look, guys, it's not going to happen. This is a unique um, uh, unique situation and we're getting something. Let's hope that it's going to be good. Yeah, I think you're totally right. And this is a very unique situation given... Like, yeah, how many times have we seen director's cuts? You see them so often, especially with big films. Years later, it's a way to make maybe some more revenue on a film. You put out the director's cut or the unseen footage that got was left on the cutting room floor, that sort of thing. But this is an instance where a, a director who left a movie before it was finished is brought back to give you the movie he wanted to give you. I, I did some research. I couldn't find anywhere where this has happened before, at least to this big of a, uh, a fandom or reaction from the people. It's pretty interesting stuff. I think a lot of it may have to do with the popularity of the Joker. Because from all reports, that director, I don't recall his name, um, oh. had complete creative control mm -hmm. over Joker. And that obviously went incredibly well. Um, so now I think maybe their Warner Brothers are investing a little bit of confidence in the filmmakers that they hire to actually do their job. Yeah, well, that's true because there was a lot of backlash from the studio about Joker, wasn't there, saying it couldn't be R, uh, had to meet all these sort of quotas. I think at one point they were like, you can't even maybe do it because there's no Batman, but they sort of entrusted him, gave him a small budget, and then it just returned dividends. But what you said at the start of all of this, Dane, is what sort of sticks back in my mind of, it's a lot of money to be spending when you're not going to see box office revenue. Like you're not going to get that money coming back in the form of ticket sales. It's subscribers. And that, I mean, I don't know how much HBO is going to cost, but. But not only that, what's interesting is like, this is Warner's admitting they made a mistake. Yeah. Like they are saying, yeah, we um, dropped the ball on that one because we booted like Snyder stepped away. But I feel like you could have, still made his film. Instead, they made the decision to bring Whedon in and he was like, I'm going to change things up. So even though Snyder, like, stepping down, he had to anyway, and he, that was his decision, there was still his movie there. And I feel like you could have brought someone in to just make that movie, but they brought Whedon in and he was like, I'm going to change it. So he did, it flopped. And now they're admitting, like, okay, that didn't work, that was dumb of us so here you go we're gonna like make amends and like let Snyder jump back on obviously things like he's now had time has passed and he's now able to jump onto the project again um whereas he couldn't at the time but it's interesting that they are pouring all this money into funding redoing a mistake they made oh, i have to disagree with you Heath. can you imagine picking up a pro four-hour project of somebody that you'd never met or maybe had met you know occasionally and um, mm. just finishing it for them. I just think that that would be an incredibly difficult job. What are the chances of this being any good? 
let's be straight down the middle. Dane, I know that you might be pretty cynical towards it, but do you actually think there's a chance that it could be better received from you than what Justice League was? Um, yeah, I mean, it has every opportunity because he's heard all the <laughs> fan feedback and criticism. He can just go and make another film pretty much or edit it to people's likings. Um, I am very interested in the outcome because of the uniqueness of the circumstances. Mm. Um, and I've always been interested in the DC universe. Um, so I am curious to see what he does. I hope it's a good film because then I get to enjoy a good film but I don't think it's going to be a good film judging from uh, Snyder's films. He's not, he's not there my cup of tea. <laughs> he's very much, he's trying hard for us, Heath, isn't he? If you can't give him any credit, you've got to give him credit for trying to be optimistic, even though it, it, it visibly Mate, pained him. the whole him. thing is like 99% CGI and like 99% slow motion. Just for Christ's sake. That's if all you took movies the slow now, motion, that's all movies. <laughs> If you if you took out the slow motion, it wouldn't go for four hours. <laughs> <Been out. laughs> hey, Thor, what do you reckon? You silly goose. Um, what was the question? Am I excited for? Do you think it has an opportunity to be to meet your expectations? Maybe. I think so. It's based on everything I've read about it. Is true. Like I like his film, so I think it. Like I enjoyed the first two. I enjoyed, sorry, I enjoyed Man and I enjoyed the director's cut for the second one. So I think it will be good. I think it will be the sort of movie that I want it to be and I'll get to see more, um, like, character development of these characters, which I was robbed of the first time. So I think it will be. But it's, it's like you mentioned before, it's going to be weird that it's going to end and it's not going to be a part two. Yeah. And it is going to be in this new format, whether that's, like, episodes or whatever. But I think it will live up to the original expectations I had. Well, we can only hope at this point. Dane shakes his head with absolute no faith at all in what he's, what he's hearing or what he's even said as he spits into the microphone. Boys, look, something tells me that once this is released in 2021, the snack, Zack Snyder directed cut of Justice League will probably be sitting here again. I feel like this isn't the end of the trifecta of well, us getting three. together. Part three will be more epic, hopefully, than what... Um, what we've, what's come before because at least hopefully by then we will have had a movie dare i say that we all enjoyed i don't know i don't Ima- know imagine a world where that would happen that in would this, be some kind of alternate universe in this friendship group i don't know if it's possible but i anticipate the day where we might get it thanks for coming on boys appreciate it thanks, thanks mate take it easy All right, thanks to Dane and Heath again for jumping on and talking all things Zack Snyder's Justice League. Um, I mean, how do you feel about it? Do you care? Like, do you, Did you maybe not care? And now you listen to this and you're like, oh, I kind of care now. Maybe I am interested in seeing this. Or are you more in the camp of, hey, I was always going to watch it. Or maybe you're just like, I couldn't give a shit about Justice League. But if you don't, I imagine you're not listening to this part. Maybe it was one of those episodes you just went, eh, not this week, Dan. Not this week. That's fine, too. That's fine, too. Regardless, let me know how you either feel about Justice League or about the podcast in general. You can head over to iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, subscribe or like the channel, and, uh, you know, you get get notified each week when one, one of these appears. Isn't that the idea? Isn't that fun? Hey, they, they let you know. Hey, Dan put a new one up. Do you want to have a listen? Yeah, what's he talking about? Not Justice League again. Uh, not all the time, guys. Not all the time. But yeah, head over there, subscribe to the channel, and uh, look. Yeah, take care of yourself. i got nothing else, really. I've still got a little bit of Easter chocolate that I'm probably going to go and have a little bite of at the moment. Um, when I say that, probably go and indulge or overindulge in some Easter chocolate. Uh, you're probably wondering, how have you still got Easter chocolate? I love Easter chocolate so much that I I bog by. No, it's not even a gift thing for me anymore. It's a purchase. I, I go and purchase Easter chocolate for myself. Um, yeah, big Easter chocolate guy. 
Anyway, that's going to be my day. Might even watch the poor man's version of the Justice League while I eat it. We'll see what happens. Either way, guys, have a good week. Talk to you soon. This has been a Cheeky Leprechaun production.